immediately fix it or you dry the slide and then fix it immediate fixation is the rule okay immediate fixation before the slide dries okay before the slide dries fix it immediately that's the rule okay with 95 percent ethanol with 95 percent ethanol okay and then you send it to the laboratory where they'll put the pap stain and they'll uh, read the slides okay now by doing this remember you are two disadvantages are there one is you are not studying the endocervix because you're only touching the transformation zone which is a part of ectocervix so where does the endocervix begin the endocervix begins above the new squamous columnar junction which is beyond your transformation zone so by using an ior spatula you are not studying the endocervix okay the second is when you do uh, this kind of a smearing technique when you follow this kind of a technique you not only study the cells but also take the mucus along with the cells which will obscure the vision of the cells and the quality of the smear will not be good if mucus is there okay we have four important viral oncogenes here e1 e2 e6 and e7 okay what do uh, e1 and e2 do e1 and e2 are early replication proteins they help in the replication process e6 and e7 are actual viral gene oncoproteins okay so what does e6 do e6 binds to p53 and it increases p53 degradation p53 is a tumor suppressor gene so when there is increased degradation of p53 there is uncontrolled cell proliferation similarly e7 activates retinoblastoma retinoblastoma gene phosphorylation and this increases e2 transcription factor and there is uncontrolled cell proliferation okay so this is what uh, uh, these proteins do okay now apart from these we also have something called l1 and l2 capsid proteins okay so why are they important it's that remember the vaccine that we have against hpv is the vaccine against l1 protein it is it, it what does it contain it contains that l1 capsid protein okay so very important and so now we've seen various parameters here basically volume ph viscosity sperm concentration total sperm count vitality progressive motility morphology round cells and leukocytes out of which there's a question asking for the best predictor of semen quality okay out of all these which is the best predictor of semen quality and the answer is morphology okay best available predictor of sperm function that means a fertilizing function is morphology sperm morphology very important mcq and we had this mcq in uh, 2019 aims exam okay so this is a 2019 aims question okay very important question now to take a pap smear we need a spatula called ior's spatula okay so this is how an ior's spatula would look like okay ior's spatula it is either an wooden spatula or a plastic spatula okay wooden or a plastic spatula okay so it will have two ends one end will be bifid like this and the other end will be convex like this okay now what do we do with this ior spatula see this is the cervix and this is the vagina okay and this is the transformation zone as we discussed this is the transformation zone okay now we insert the ior spatula with the big end of or the bifid end getting into the endocervix like this okay so what we're going to see next is a doins retractor okay so this is a doins retractor what is it used for it is used to retract the anterior abdominal wall when we perform a cesarean sex usually in obstetrics and gynecology we use it during cesarean section to retract the bladder say this is the uterus and this is the vagina and say the bladder is sitting on the top say the bladder is sitting on the top of the uterus and the vagina like this this white sheet is the bladder what we do is we separate the uv fold of peritoneum and we put this retractor into this area between the bladder and say this white thing is bladder this blue thing is the uterus we put it inside like this and we drag the bladder down okay we drag the bladder down so that it does not interfere with the operating area okay so this is doins retractor okay so um we use it during cesarean we use it during laparotomy we use it in abdominal hysterectomies uh, repair of prolapse and so on okay fine the next instrument for now is uh, this okay look at this instrument 
Uh, so how do I uh, describe this instrument? This instrument has got a triangular tip, okay. See the tip, it is triangular, okay. It has a triangular tip and also it has transverse serrations in it, okay. So inside it has transverse uh, serrations in it, okay. So where do we use this? We use this instrument to hold the cuttings of the uterus in case of cesarean section, okay. So HCG increases only in trisomy 21. HCG falls in the other two, okay. HCG falls in the other two. The last is inhibin and remember inhibin is not applicable for 18 and 13. Inhibin is applicable only for 21 and also remember inhibin increases with downs, okay. So how I remember is this I for I, inhibin increased, okay. So inhibin is increased in downs whereas it is not applicable for 18 and 13 okay so this is about a quad test or second trimester aneuploidy screening okay four important parameters are included in this alpha fetoprotein unconjugated estriol hcg and inhibin okay so the points to remember are alpha fetoprotein and unconjugated estriol are low in uh, downs Whereas the other two HCG and inhibin are high in downs, okay. So at least you have to be thorough with. Why? Because 2018 AIMS, 2018 AIMS is where we had this question, okay. What happens to different parameters in downs, okay. So down, down, up, up. Doubling time of HCG is around 48 hours or 2 days okay 48 hours or 2 days and we can have it as 1.422 this is the actual range 1.42 2 days but for all mcq purposes i would want you to choose 2 days 48 hours if you have to choose a single best answer okay so how many subunits do we have in hcg we have two subunits alpha subunit and beta subunit okay alpha subunit and beta subunit for all practical reasons we only measure beta subunit because alpha subunit is non-specific, beta subunit is specific. So alpha subunit of HCG is similar to the alpha subunits of various other hormones like FSH, LH and TSH, okay. So what are the hormones that are structurally similar to HCG? They are, the hormones that are structurally similar to uh, HCG are FSH, LH and TSH, okay. FSH, LH. TSH and HCG, all the four hormones save the, have the same alpha chain. They differ with respect to their beta chains, okay. So, these are the different MCQs here. Whatever I have mentioned here is all an MCQ, okay. It's a glycoprotein. It acts on the LH receptors 36 to 1000. Because the external genitalia is normal female type. So, this is about Mullerian agenesis. Next is Turner's, okay. And when I say Turner's, this includes the features of pure gonadal dysgenesis also because I told you Turner's and PGD are you know clinically the same except for one difference in turners both the long and the short arm are missing in pgd that is pure gonadal dysgenesis only the long arm is missing the short arm is present and therefore the as far as the gonads are concerned clinically they would be the same except for the differences in anomalies okay so what is the karyotype in turners the karyotype in turners is karyotype in turners is of Mullerian agenesis, Turner's, TFS and Swires. Okay, Mullerian agenesis, Turner's, TFS. See, if you know this table, if you know this, all these years in AIMS, in PGI, in INICT, I mean in JIPMA, whatever they've been asking, okay, is all from this table only. Okay, whatever they've been asking, is all from this table only. Okay, so if you know this table, you can practically solve many, many questions from primary amenorrhea okay so these are some important causes of primary amenorrhea mullerian agenesis turner's testicular feminization syndrome and wires okay testosterone testosterone will either be normal or it will be elevated why it will either be normal or it will be elevated why because it's not a problem with the synthesis it's only a problem with the peripheral action so whenever there is resistance in the periphery the hormone levels will increase yes or no like how we have diabetes insulin resistance is the key pathology in diabetes right 
So what happens to insulin levels in the body? There is hyperinsulinemia in type 2 diabetes because of the resistance. Here again there is resistance. So in turn what happens? Whenever the, and or the androgen is not working, the pituitary also it won't work. Okay. Pituitary is under constant inhibitory effect of peripheral sex steroids. Estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, all the three inhibit the pituitary. Now, pituitary's receptors, especially these androgen receptors are not responding to this testosterone. So, what, the, what the pituitary will think? The pituitary might think that there is less testosterone in the body. The pituitary will secrete more and more luteinizing hormone. Pituitary will secrete more luteinizing hormone and in turn testosterone levels will increase. You understand my point? Yes. So, what will happen to dihydrotestosterone? Dihydrotestosterone will decrease. Dihydrotestosterone will decrease. You now wonder why, right? When the testosterone levels are high, why should the dihydrotestosterone levels decrease? That's what your question is. Yes or no? Yes, I'll tell you. See, dihydrotestosterone is not directly secreted by the testes. You understand my point? What is secreted by the testes is mainly testosterone and androstenedione, not dihydrotestosterone. Hypothalamus. This is also applicable for hypothalamus. All the hormones will decrease. Okay, all the hormones will decrease. A decrease in FSH, LH, relactin, estrogen and progesterone. The only difference between pituitary and hypothalamic cause is this. Remember, prolactin is under the inhibitory effect of. Prolactin is under the inhibitory effect of hypothalamus. So, when the hypothalamus doesn't work, it does not necessarily affect prolactin. Prolactin can either remain normal, prolactin can either remain normal or it can increase. But the thing is what hypothalamus has hormones which help in prolactin secretion, hypothalamus also has hormones which inhibit prolactin secretion. For example, I am telling hypothalamus has dopamine which inhibits prolactin, hypothalamus has TRH which increases prolactin. You understand my point, it says it has dual action, so basically it does not affect Prolactin much, but other hormones like say FSH, LH, estrogen and progesterone decrease in hypothalamus. So, what is the difference between pituitary and hypothalamic cause? The main difference is GnRH. Between pituitary and hypothalamic cause, the main difference is what? GnRH. Here, there is an increase in GnRH. Here, there is a decrease in GnRH. Okay, there is a decrease in GnRH. That's the main difference between these two conditions. Finally, pregnancy. So, what happens in pregnancy? In pregnancy, estrogen is high. Estrogen is high. Progesterone is high. Okay. And remember, during pregnancy, estrogen and progesterone do not come from, estrogen and progesterone do not come from the ovaries. Rather, they come from another source called placenta. Placenta is the main source of estrogen and progesterone during pregnancy and the, the, body does, the body does not depend on ovaries for estrogen and progesterone. Okay? So, I am stressing on this point because it is independent of the pituitary. That is what I am telling. Okay? The, the source of estrogen and progesterone, the placenta is independent of the pituitary. So, this estrogen and progesterone, what, does it, what do they do? They inhibit the pituitary and they decrease FSH levels. They decrease FSH. LH levels. Okay. So, pregnancy is one important condition where both estrogen and progesterone increase and ultimately FSH and LH decrease. Prolactin also increases. Okay. So, what are the drugs uh, used uh, in PCOS for infertility? Four main drugs they are letrozole, clomiphene, uh, FSH and pulsatile GnRH. Apart from that additional drugs are metformin, inositol group, laparoscopic ovarian drilling and vitamin D. Okay. So, um, this is about uh, treatment. Something about metformin. What does metformin do here? Okay. Now, we have a huge list here. I want you to know this. Metformin increases the insulin sensitivity. Metformin decreases weight. It, dec it, it decreases the BMI. It decreases blood pressure. It uh, decreases um, LDL. Okay. Um, bad cholesterol. And it also decreases uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It decreases inflammation and it increases ovulation rates. Okay. So, it, it has a lot of benefits. But remember, Metformin is not a drug for ovulation induction and metformin is also not a drug for weight loss. Okay, it should not be used for that indication. Okay, physical and improving physical activity is the main 
thing behind uh, losing weight okay um, so fine metformin is a category b drug so can we use it for women anxious to conceive yes we can use it for women who are anxious to conceive but this is this drug should not be used routinely for a pregnant lady unless there is an impaired glucose tolerance if only there is an impaired glucose tolerance you can use metformin during pregnancy for routine uh, managing though it decreases the incidence of diabetes um, you should not be using metformin uh, routinely for all pcos women next is statins statins also are useful in pcos they decrease the cardiovascular risk they decrease the incidence of stroke or mi and statins should not be used during pregnancy so avoid statins uh, for women who are anxious to conceive okay so what's the role of vitamin d here uh, pcos women are naturally deficient in vitamin d okay so vitamin d supplementation is very important for these women and vitamin d increases insulin sensitivity it improves lipid profile it decreases androgen levels and it decreases uh, inflammatory markers so four important actions increases insulin sensitivity improves lipid profile it decreases androgen levels and it decreases the inflammatory markers and also vitamin d can be used in women who are anxious to conceive okay so what are the other important options here we have statins we have aspirin which again lower the cardiovascular risk and it can be used but statins should not be used for women who are anxious to conceive rosiglitazone uh, increases insulin sensitivity that can be used again not for women who are anxious to conceive okay and these two drugs glp1 analogs and dpp4 inhibitors are under trial for um, uh, use in pcos but uh, they they're not approved by fda till now okay so these drugs avoid in women anxious to conceive aspirin sometimes can be used if there is a proper indication but not routinely okay so coming to combined oral contraceptives remember the only benefit of coc in pcos is correcting a menstrual abnormality and a fourth generation coc with anti androgen compound might work on hirsutism and acne but otherwise coc does not correct it has no effect on insulin resistance it does not improve insulin uh, sensitivity okay and it has no effect on weight management as well okay 25% of the women are asymptomatic okay 25% of them are asymptomatic which age group does it more commonly involve it more commonly involves 30 to 45 years it more commonly involves 30 to 45 years okay so it can either spread superficially throughout the pelvis or it can go deep into one particular organ which is more dangerous or which is more severe spreading superficially over the entire pelvis or going deep into one particular organ obviously depth okay so depth of the lesion is more important than the spread of the lesion okay depth of the lesion is more important than the spread of the lesion and non pigmented lesions are more symptomatic than pigmented this i think should appear new to you so please remember non pigmented lesions are more symptomatic non pigmented lesions are more symptomatic when compared to pigmented lesions so what is the most common symptom very very important mcq point most common symptom most common symptom is dysmenorrhea most common symptom is dysmenorrhea and what type of dysmenorrhea is this it is congestive type of dysmenorrhea we otherwise call it secondary dysmenorrhea okay this is congestive type of dysmenorrhea in other words we call it secondary dysmenorrhea and remember dysmenorrhea is the most common symptom okay we also have a unique word called triple dysmenorrhea here okay so what is triple dysmenorrhea congestive dysmenorrhea is one type of dysmenorrhea which starts usually before menses and it continues throughout menses in endometriosis particularly we have this type of dysmenorrhea called triple dysmenorrhea and in this triple dysmenorrhea pain usually starts before the onset of menses it continues throughout menses and it also continues after menses okay so presence of pain okay presence of pain before during 
and after menses. Okay. Presence of pain before, during and after menses is called triple dysmenorrhea. Okay. Pain before, during and after menses is called triple dysmenorrhea. So, where do we see this triple dysmenorrhea? We see this triple dysmenorrhea in endometriosis. Okay. Triple dysmenorrhea is a feature of endometriosis. Okay. So, what is the most common age group? 30 to 45 is the most common age group. It usually involves women in the late reproductive age. Okay. 25% of them are asymptomatic. Remaining are symptomatic and symptom varies from dysmenorrhea to various other symptoms like infertility, menorrhagia and so on. But most common symptom is dysmenorrhea and classically what we have is triple dysmenorrhea which is pain before, during and after menses. So, uterus is a pear shaped organ. Uterus is a pear shaped organ. Okay. It has a body or the corpus and it has cervix okay cervix okay so what's the normal length of the uterus the normal length of the uterus for an early gravid lady is 6 to 8 centimeter okay is 6 to 8 centimeter whereas for a multi gravid lady it is 9 to 10 centimeter Okay, for a nulli gravid lady, it is 6 to 8 centimeter and for a multi gravid lady, it is 9 to 10 centimeter. Okay, so these are two important MCQs. What's the weight of a non-pregnant uterus? The weight of a non-pregnant uterus is 60 gram. This is another MCQ. Okay, weight of a non-pregnant uterus is 60 gram. Okay, and the cervix is, the cervix is the lowermost portion of the uterus the mouth of the uterus and say this is the body of the uterus and this is the cervix we have internal os which is the opening part of the entry part of the cervix and this is the external os. MCQs and CMA most common cause of sensory neural hearing loss in neonates what is the answer CMV okay most common cause of sensory neural hearing loss in neonates is CMV most common cause of perinatal infection is again CMV Okay, perinatal infection. Highest transmission rate in CMV is in which trimester? As I already told you, third trimester. Certain textbooks say, certain MCQ guides say that there is no trimester preponderance to CMV infection. And that's a wrong information. Please change it. Highest transmission rate in CMV is in the third trimester according to Williams Obstetrics. Okay, so primary infection does not offer lifelong protection in CMV. And percentage of fetuses is developing congenital CMV syndrome. I told you 5 to congenital infection is up to 70% but not, not all of them will develop CMV syndrome. Only 5 to 10% of these fetuses develop CMV syndrome. Indication for invasive testing or amniocentesis as I already told you is positive IgG, positive IgG, positive IgM with a low avidity. Okay, positive IgG, positive IgM with a low avidity okay so these are the important questions in so um is it gonadotropin dependent no it's gonadotropin independent okay so it does not respond to gnrh or fsh and it gradually falls with age and that is why amh can be measured in any given day of the cycle and but fsh estradiol are best measured on day two of the cycle whereas amh is can amh can be measured on any given day of the cycle and this is the overall best marker for ovarian reserve okay so what's the cutoff value it depends on the age we have various cutoffs depending on the age uh, but for our mcqs to say that this is a very bad ovarian reserve we can take it as 0.2 to 0.7 anything less than 0.2 to 0.7 nanogram per ml please students i want you to remember the units for fsh i told you international units per liter for estradiol i told you picogram per ml and for progesterone i told you nanogram per ml for inhibin again i told you picogram per ml and here amh i'm telling you nanogram per ml 0.2 to 0.7 nanogram per ml is the lowest cutoff for amh below which the ovaries are unlikely to respond to any amount of gonadotropins so preterm labor is not only the uh, most common complication but also the most common cause for perinatal morbidity so next question here is what is the incidence of preterm labor in twin pregnancy the incidence of preterm labor in twin pregnancy is around 50 percent. The incidence of preterm labor in twin pregnancy is 
50 percent this is another mcq okay so this is one mcq and this is another mcq very important two important mcqs okay so next question here among the complications that are unique for twin pregnancies uh, most of them occur in monochorionic placenta because I already told you dichorionic has got good prognosis, monochorionic has got bad prognosis out of which monoamniotic has got the worst prognosis. So among the unique complications that we mentioned here, where do we see these vascular complications and where do we see this cord related complications, okay. Please remember vascular complications are more common in, okay, vascular complications are more common in mono chorionic diamniotic twin pregnancy okay mcda again i'm telling next question is investigation of choice for suspected uterine anomaly what is the investigation of choice for suspected uterine anomaly answer is hsg investigation of choice for suspected uterine anomaly is hsg but hsg is not the gold standard why HSG is not the gold standard? Because HSG cannot differentiate two important, the two most common uterine anomalies. Okay, so what are the two most common uterine anomalies? Bicornuate septate and bicornuate. Okay, so how does septate look? Say this. What are the imminent symptoms we worried about here? Imminent symptoms or otherwise called as impending symptoms are so called because they are warning symptoms that they that will tell you that this lady is about to throw off it. She is she's about to or she's going to throw off it. Okay. Imminent symptoms. So what are those imminent symptoms? Those warning symptoms will tell you that she's about to develop a seizure. Number one, headache. Headache. And the type of headache is more commonly occipital headache. Okay. More commonly, occipital lobe is involved here. So, occipital headache. Number two, visual disturbance. Okay, visual disturbance. And the most common visual disturbance associated with preeclampsia is scotoma. Okay. Scotoma or field defect is the most common visual disturbance associated with preeclampsia. Next is reduced urine output. Okay. Reduced urine output. So, how do we describe this reduced urine output here? Urine output less than 30 ml per hour. Okay. Urine output less than 30 ml per hour. Okay. Fourth is what? Epigastric pain. Okay. Epigastric pain. What is this epigastric pain due to? This epigastric pain is due to stretching of stretching of the glissens capsule. Stretching of the glissens capsule due to subcapsular hematoma okay stretching of the glissens capsule due to subcapsular hematoma of liver stretching of the glissens capsule due to subcapsular hematoma of the liver so <clears throat> these are the four important imminent symptoms you have to know along with headache you can also have vomiting okay so now i have told you three important categories to decide on whether it is only hypertension or preeclampsia